you are watching Now You See TV. Sit back and enjoy the ride. A reality that lurks beneath the surface of our society. Embedded deep within the esoteric workings of Satanism and the occult. Are vampires real? And what influence on our society do they have? You aren't drinking anything but blood. It's forbidden in the Bible to drink blood. Certainly there's a tie to the occult. It's appealing and it's romantic. Welcome to Now You See TV, everybody. This is John Pounders, and I have in the studio with me Jacob Grant. What's up, Jake? Hey, what's up, everybody? Doing doing good. <laughs> Yo, I know you're, you've you been feeling better. I think you had food poisoning last uh, just last night, and you're just now recovering from it. And the same something very similar happened to Joseph last time we were going to do this show, and it's just been a – this. you know, oddly enough, this is probably one of the hardest shows that uh, we've had – got that we had to put upon it once. Uh, we've had issues just getting to the office today and, and with Jake being sick. And so we know that there's something to the show uh, that needs to be put out and we're, we're super excited about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yesterday I was wrapped up in a cocoon of blankets and I knew we have a big trip. We're going up to Colorado and then up uh, to visit with the river winds uh, on day uh, on the Cheyenne reservation. So we're looking forward to that trip. And I was really worried. I was like, man, what are the odds of me getting this sick right before a big trip like that? But I'm definitely feeling, feeling a little better. And, and I think we'll be able to make that drive tonight. Yeah, it's going to be a long drive. We got like a 15 hour drive after the show tonight. So be in prayer for us. And then we're, um, we're going to be in Denver shooting a documentary uh, that we're doing on just basically the, you know, I don't haven't figured out what we're going to call it yet, but basically it's about the hijacking of uh, an entire group of different kinds of nation and different kinds of people. I mean, we have a mixing pot and a melting pot, the hijacking of the, the native lands from hijacking of that to the hijacking of uh, the people that are already here, hijacking of the freedom and just everything from monetary reform, et cetera. So it's going to be a documentary we've been we're going to be shooting on that. There's a lot of stuff. And then we're also going to be talking about uh, just different things. And then, like you said, we're going to the northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation with uh, the river winds and a group of people that they're bringing. And we're going to be shooting uh, the documentary that we've been talking about, about the Hebrew roots of the uh, Native Americans. And we're excited about that. And I think it's probably going to be the best documentary that we've done. And it probably, it, you know, just the subject matter alone is enough to excite people because uh, as Joseph can tell you, and he's told you, told, we talked about before, there's really a revival kind of going on in the Native American lands, uh, mm -hmm. knowing their roots and figuring out these things. And it's been pretty amazing. But um, anyways, without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Joseph Riverwind to the show. How's it going, Joseph? Hi, Karaya, my brothers from the same Heavenly Father. How are you all doing? We are alive and well, and that's about all we can ask for anymore. So. <laughs> well, was, man, I, I tell you, it's been, it, it's, it's been something trying to get this show uh, aired and out there. And, you know, we've got intercessors. We've got people praying. Uh, you know, we're all called to expose the darkness, and we all have our piece of the puzzle that, that we bring to see the collective whole. And uh, it's just an honor and blessing we're... Looking forward to you guys coming out to the Lame Deer Reservation, to the land of the Zizitsa, uh, as they call themselves, which means people of the fringes. Wow. Uh, so, so we're looking forward to, to having you all come out and, and film and, and, uh, and, and just have an, have an experience out there and have an encounter and, and uh, see a whole different world uh, right here within our own country in Turtle Island. That, and then we're looking forward to it, man, just as much as uh, anybody can imagine, just because – like just just what you said there the people of the fringe i mean what else could that possibly even mean so, <laughs> we're uh but we're i'm gonna we're gonna show a video real quick that we took uh down in the serpent mounds and we just kind of pointed some things out got some good aerial footage of stuff like that and then we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit about it because i know you have some insight whereas we were just basically walking around filming the place and kind of pointing out different solstice markers and uh having a native americans perspective uh on this is 
important. And in fact, you probably even have a different perspective than a lot of other Native Americans on these mounds and, and just more of a, uh, for lack of a better term, using a trendy term, a woke perspective on <laughs> on these burial mounds. So we're going to play this video real quick and uh, then we'll uh, discuss it from there. The amount of time it must have taken to create this burial mound, this serpent mound, it's enormous. There's signs all over the place telling us not to stand on these sacred mounds. Um, they're very respectful of these grounds. It's a piece of history. What do you think, John? What does this place make you think of? I don't know. It's definitely got an eerie feeling, but it also uh, just amazing. It looks it reminds me of awesome golf course, really, is what it reminds me of. But definitely has the serpent thing. As we go up here, you'll see it looks like the serpent mouth is opening up to eat an egg. So we're here at the ancient serpent mounds in Peebles, Ohio, and we were at the Take on the World conference. We decided to stop by. We've seen the work of Ellie Marzulli, Joseph Riverwind, and those that speak on this subject. And as we look out here, you guys can see that this serpent mound goes hundreds of yards this way and this way. It coils, and you'll see the aerial footage that we have. It just co coils all the way around and goes up to a head at the top here or it looks like it's actually eating an egg. Right in between this. As you can as you can see the sun, this is where we have the moonrise and the summer solstice sunrise, and we have the sunset 
almost exactly parallel with these signs right here. And this is pretty much directly in the middle of these serpent mounds. Too. This is where the sun's setting, it looks like, but it also looks like it sets from over there. It's pretty interesting. If you look out as far as you can see, your hills, this is like one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been. Um, and pretty amazing. I've noticed that about Ohio. This seems like a, 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 a pretty state, and I'm not surprised that they chose this area of country to build something like this. Uh, just the way the hills and the light and the trees and the plants, everything, it's uh, really quite something to look at. We, we don't really say any much more over the top of this so we can kind of talk over the video here, but that's that's pretty much what we got, man. We just kind of went around and shot some footage of it because obviously we didn't really know what we were looking at so much as we were just uh, – shooting the footage and pointing out the solstice mark. So I'm going to let you take us on this journey, Joseph, and, and mm -hmm. tell us what we're looking at. Tell us what this is and the bigger picture uh, behind this. Absolutely. Whole. Absolutely. Well, this is, uh, you know, the serpent mound. Uh, this is, as far as I know, the, the largest serpent effigy in the world. Uh, so and it's right there in Ohio. Uh, it is it, it can be seen from uh, from up in the atmosphere. Uh, from from a great distance, and there's been a lot of speculation as to what the meanings are for it. Uh, but I think what, where we could start is in the oral tradition of the tribes. Now, there's there's many tribes that used to inhabit Ohio, uh, the Chippewa, the Ottawa, uh, the Iroquois, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, uh, Tuscarora, uh, the Lenny Lenape. Uh, also known as the Delaware, uh, and and the Shawnee uh, as well. Uh, so those are just a few of the tribes that inhabited that region. But one of the things that that every every one of the people from the tribe will tell you is that their ancestors uh, were not the ones who built these mounds. That these mounds were here long before uh, any tribes had migrated into those regions of the land, um, according to their own migration stories. I mean, every tribe has their own story and oral tradition. I don't speak for all the tribes, just from the knowledge that, that I've heard and the wisdom that I've, I've learned throughout the years listening to the elders from different tribes. Uh, it's interesting to note that the Lenape, uh, the, the Delaware Native people uh, who are currently in Oklahoma, the Lenny Lenape, uh, that it, according to their oral tradition, the Allegheny are the ones who built the Serpent Mound. Now, the Allegheny is where we get the word for like the Allegheny Mountains uh, up in the, the north uh, eastern part of the United States, the mountain chain. Now, Allegheny uh, is the name of a giant tribe. Uh, it, it's one of the tribes that that whole region was named 
uh, the Allegheny uh, or Allegheny or Telegheny is another uh, other different ways that it's been written according to historical records. Uh, but in the oral tradition, the Allegheny were giants that inhabited that entire region uh, before there was a, a compact between the Mohawk and the Huron uh, to go and fight and defeat these tribes of giants. Uh, they were anywhere from seven foot to nine foot tall. Uh, they inhabited that entire region. Uh, they were the mound builders, the ones who built the mounds. Uh, and much of that, I mean, there was a time when there was both societies uh, living together, both regular sized people uh, and the Allegheny, the, the giant people. Uh, but it was never a, a good mix. It was usually a, a domination uh, type of thing where the societal structure was with the giants being the rulers and the ones in power often going out in raids uh, and, and capturing people from the nearby villages uh, unless there was a, a, you know, a rebellion which did take place. Uh, it's recorded in a wampum belt uh, that's, that's held by the Mohawk, uh, this great battle that took place between the warriors and the giants. So we have one, one oral tradition from one specific tribe that tells us that who built these, uh, not only the mounds, but the serpent mound itself. And these, the, the, the Lape, uh, in their oral tradition, uh, also say the same, have the same description of the giants. Oftentimes they had red hair, sometimes double rows of teeth, uh, six fingers on each hand, six toes, and uh, typical traits uh, of, of what we call the, the byproduct of the star people and the human beings. Have you heard any of that, John or Jake? <laughs> I, I haven't. I, I can I, Jake might have. He did a little more research on it than I did. But, um, uh, you know, I, I never heard that, man. That's pretty interesting. Um, you, you know, I, Jacob, would, did you have any insight to that? I know you researched a little bit before we left. Yeah, I know. Um, when, when looking at some of the Nephilim tribes or some of the giant tribes uh, that supposedly migrated north um, out of the kind of the Mideast area, um, those who were kind of attributed with uh, Gog and Magog often were looked at as red-haired, six-fingered giants. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very possible that, you know, those giant tribes that kind of left the land of Israel where the Israelites were told, you need to wipe these guys out, you need to make sure they don't survive. Well, the Israelites failed at their command, you know, from God to wipe out these Nephilim tribes, mm -hmm. um, the Rephaim, the Nephilim, the, uh, uh, just the, the Anakim. Um, and some of those very possibly migrated North, um, and also migrated, um, across uh, the continent into the North American, uh, area that we see today. Um, and you know, uh, when we looked at some of the videos from like L.A. Marzulli talking about these um, these mounds, you know, he also you know was kind of coming from the position of you know these are often attributed with Native American tribes, but it's very interesting that you know a, lo a lot of the burial mounds um, in this part of the Americas um, they they can could also be traced back to these Nephilim giants um, that also lived in North America. You know, it's interesting that you brought up, um, you know, this migration of this dispersion of of the tribes, the Canaanite tribes, the Rephaim, the uh, I know there's there's un, the Anunnaki. Uh, interestingly enough, in my Arawak language, our word for enemy is Anunnaki, um, and and I, when you said that, it just like triggered this memory uh, of that in my language. There's uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but at, when we were doing the Serpent Mound Conference. With L.A. Marzulli and Russ Dizdar, um, uh, Gary Stearman, uh, Fritz Zimmerman. I mean, just incredible researchers. I, you know, I, I was like, Creator, why am I here? These guys are powerhouses. You know, I, I, I just I know so little about what these guys are are, are teaching, the depths of what they were teaching. Um, I just felt, you know, very very small. Uh, but but Creator brought us to that that Serpent Mound conference, and it was at that conference that a man. Uh, came up to us and he he brought with him a artifact and this artifact is a lance head uh, that is is pretty heavy uh, it's hand hammered uh, he found it he brought it in you know they all all the guys were looking at it and saying oh it's a sword it's a sword but it didn't have 
the the typical pieces like the the hilt piece that would go on a sword and when i looked at it i i, I saw it you know through ethnocentric eyes you know through through the lens of, of my culture and i saw this and i said guys this is this is a gigantic warhead lance this is the you know this is what would sit on a seven or eight foot tall pole uh which which that goes directly with the oral tradition of many tribes that these giant tribes they would have these gigantic spears you know seven eight foot tall spears and on them would be affixed these gigantic um blades and they could easily spear two to three warriors at one time so it was at the very serpent mound conference that that we got that lance uh and i i have the lance now i have the nephilim artifact uh in my possession it was gifted to me before he, he left the country uh to go on mission work and he just said the lord told him to to gift me with the lance i'd know what to do with it and you i, I want to uh address what you said about them migrating here from the middle east uh the time frame works the time frames when you when you put them uh together between the expulsion of, of the tribes uh in the land of judea and then you see this influx of a migration or just all of a sudden uh many many of these stories and, and giant tribes are inhabiting turtle island on this side well we've had the the lance head analyzed uh by by a person who's a metallurgist uh professor and we received the initial reports of the origin of this lance uh now we're still waiting to find out how old the lance is uh but here's what's really interesting the metals that this lance was made from are from the middle east specifically wow. turkey morocco and the area of judea so what is a gigantic Nephilim head lance doing that was made in the Middle East over here in the Great Lakes region of the United States. It validates the oral tradition of the tribes. You guys are the first people that, that we've told that to. So <laughs> just wanted to share that with the listeners out there. There's so much, there's so much thing, there's so many things here that are so unexplained. I was, we we're talking before the show here in Evansville about two miles from where we're at right this moment. Uh, there's actually these places called angel mounds and they've never excavated them for some reason. And there's really, really nothing like going on there. They just kind of got them roped off and you're not supposed to go dig around in them. But uh, we have a friend here that has, you know, those showcases. He's got like 10 showcases full of artifacts that he's found in the riverbeds that are uh, not from the Native American culture that was actually here, which is interesting. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's so many things that prove a lot of these um you know, the, I guess, what do you call them? Oral traditions of the elders and stuff that you guys have. Um, it, it's amazing. And people, you know, I, I, I one, one question I wanted to ask while we're talking about artifacts and different things uh, in Lovelock, or is it Lovelock Cave, I believe, the giant um, skeleton, skull that they found. Uh, are you familiar with what might have happened to that? Because I was trying to hunt it down. And obviously, from what I understand, it's just nowhere to be found. The uh, Lovelock Cave is in the land of the Paiute tribes, and the Paiutes have the, ex the same stories, red-haired giants uh, that cover the land. And um, I saw one of the questions that somebody put in the chat room was, are there native stories about what happened to the giants? Yes, there are. Uh, several of the stories, there were battles against these giants, for example, Lovelock Cave, which John just brought up. Uh, in the Paiute stories, these giants, they were raiding people, raiding the tribes, uh, the warriors came together. Uh, oftentimes, the arrows just wouldn't pierce their skin. Uh, some of the tribes, the name for these giants uh, translated into stone skin or stone skin giants. And according to the story, what they did was they were able to, to put a bunch of brush and, and greenery and grass and just flammable um, things in front of the cave where these giants were. Uh, that's where they were assembled. That's where they would sleep. And so they, they were in effect trying not trying to smoke the giants out of the cave but build a smoke um like a smoke bomb to where they would suffocate inside and whenever they would try to come out of the cave the warriors just shot volleys and volleys and volleys of arrows at them aiming at their heads aiming for their eyes and it would drive them back into the cave until all of them had suffocated and died um, and for the longest time those bones those gigantic bones of those skeletons just laid there uh, the Paiute people just left it alone. They didn't mess with it. Uh, much like even the traditions today of you don't walk on top of a mound. Um, you don't, you know, you, we can stand around them. and But those places are very charged, uh, for lack of a better word, 
with demonic power, Nephilim power, bad energy, bad medicine, uh, whatever circles you run in, whatever language uh, group or description you want to put to it, uh, evil is evil. And oftentimes, uh, a lot of those places are charged with blood sacrifices, with the prayers, with incantations, with occult ceremonies, which the giant tribes were heavy into. Uh, blood drinking, they were cannibalistic. Uh, they did uh, sex magic. Um, and there was there was nothing good about the tribes. Now, the question about what happened to them, uh, just like with the Choctaw stories, the Choctaws have a story where, where Abba, which is the Choctaw name for God, Abba came to a man named Nua and told him to build a large canoe and, and put the, the animals that he told him to put on the canoe because the earth was going to be covered with water. And the reason why was to destroy the tribes of giants that, that were becoming like a cancer on the land. It's interesting. And, and so I guess a question I would have, so this, these serpent mounds that we're looking at, and obviously they're on solstice markers. There's like three curves to them and they're all on different mm -hmm. solstice markers. Are they also connected to ley lines? And um, what significance does the meteorite, I guess, uh, lake there that, that the meteorite hit there have to all of this stuff? Well, to, okay. To understand that, John, um, the one of the one of the first things that we'll go to is is what the serpent is, is named. Uh, it's called uh, Mishabishu, um, which means the great serpent. Uh, and that, that's the the a loose translation of what that name means. Uh, the literal translation of, of Mishabishu uh, is the master of the underworld uh, or lord of the beneath world. And in the oral tradition of the native people, he was often depicted like a like a hybrid between a horned serpent and like a, like a water dragon um, uh, or, or a beast of the water, uh, uh, more like a, like a horned reptile type of beast, the Uktina. Uh, and is always associated with water though. And this is one of the reasons why this, this earthworks was placed pointing towards this, this meteorite, uh, where this meteorite had hit. Um, again, it's a charged area, the land is charged. You know, you have people who are very sensitive or maybe they're new age uh, and they're like, oh, I feel a difference here, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you, your body will, will feel a physical difference when you're around places like this because the spiritual energy around it is completely different. And especially if you're walking in the kingdom of light uh, and you're covered by the blood of Yeshua, you're empowered with the Ruach HaKodesh and the Holy Spirit. If you have that gift of discernment, uh, that discerning gift is a gift between knowing what's good and what's evil, the spirits uh, that are there in a place. So you've got you've got the the alignment, and, and I'm going to get to the ley lines too because that's important. Uh, the the way that this serpent was created. So you've got this great serpent, master of the underworld, uh, lord of the beneath world, uh, and in the native stories, it, it said that that this creature would drag people into the water. It was also caused floods. Uh, it was never talked about during. The, like the spring and the summer seasons, it was always talked about during the winter seasons uh, because it was believed that it was encased in ice during that time. Uh, in the ancient stories, it says that there was only one other spiritual being that could that could defeat uh, this great serpent, and that was the the Thunderbirds. For is the is the closest translation we can get in English. Uh, but these were great winged spiritual beings that had the power to subdue the Mishibashu. Uh, and I mean, you know, looking at it through through biblical lenses, uh, it sounds like angels to me. Uh, you know, maybe they were archangels, maybe, I, I don't know, you know, one of the more powerful ones, fighting angel. Uh, but you know, to say that it, these, these massive winged spiritual beings were the only ones that had power uh, over this horned serpent, um, is there a biblical uh, co correlation? I don't know. Uh, it, it could be possible. Uh, now, the, there, they are aligned to the solstices, uh, like a lot of these earthworks were. You know, some of the knowledge that the star people brought with them was knowledge of the stars. Uh, so as they brought the knowledge of the stars with them, uh, you see a lot of this uh, star knowledge or Nephilim knowledge or Nephilim architecture, uh, as Ali Marzulli likes to call it, uh, all throughout uh, the world, not just in the Americas. Uh, now, initially, this this serpent snake uh, it was covered with dolomite stone. Uh, why it was covered? Why it was covered? That I don't know. But uh, so imagine the video that you shot, where we see it all covered in grass. Well, at one time it was covered with these stones, dolomite stones, 
uh, to where it would look like scales uh, on the serpent itself. Um, this particular serpent is aligned with the constellation Draco. Uh, you can look up the constellation Draco. It's a dragon serpent, uh, and it's pretty pretty precise of uh, the serpent mound uh, in its alignment with the with the Draco constellation. Even the the pole star, uh, which is Thuban, is Draconis. Uh, it's a geographical center within the first of the seven coils from the head. Uh, so, so there's definitely an alignment with that constellation. Uh, the head is aligned uh, with the summer solstice. Uh, the coils are aligned with the summer solstice, the equinox, sunrise, uh, all, all of them, as well as the winter solstice. Uh, and also the, the three coils are lined up with six major lunar events. Because remember, the native calendar, the First Nations calendar that we would go by is a lunar calendar. Uh, oftentimes there being 13 months in a lunar year. So the coils or, or the humps on the snake uh, correlate with six lunar events, both uh, moon rises and moon sets. Uh, so you could, you could both use this to track lunar and you could use it to track solar. So what significance or what, I guess, what is Draco? I mean, I've, I've heard of it, but for the audience, what does um, this mean? To most people, this this constellation Draco that this serpent mound lines up with. Well, in in the native way, the the constellation of the Draco is the same as the Uktina. Uh, Uktina is the horned serpent. It's the serpent of the underworld. Uh, typically, whenever this constellation is in the sky, uh, it was believed that that's when you had to amp up your prayers. That's when more ceremonies were done uh, to defend uh, either yourself or the people from. Uh, any of the, the spirits, the the Wendigos or or the Wanagis that would come uh, during this season, depending on what, whatever you know tribe you come from, you have different names for these dark spirits that would be released during the seasons that that the Draco or Uktina constellation was in the sky. Uh, it, it, I wonder uh, I, if you know Meshubishu is the name of of this of this creature, this uh, Lord of the of the underworld, Lord of Darkness. And it sounds very similar to Machu Picchu uh, in Peru. And I don't know if there's a connection there or not. I thought that's what you were saying, minus, uh, yeah, I just thought you pronounced it differently. So, but yeah. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, no, no. yeah. It's crazy. I've been reading a book called uh, Fingerprint of the Gods by Graham Hancock, and he um, goes over all these different serpent civilizations. And, and it's so interesting. A lot of people don't know this, but America is actually, it means land of the plume serpent at least according to um, a lot of different scholars. And, and it's just the serpent worship, I mean, is, is worldwide, but in here, in a, it seems like in Central America and here in Ohio, especially, I think that there is somewhere up, up to 100,000 mounds in the area. I mean, real real haunted land from what I can understand. And, and you were saying that the eerie feeling, you definitely get an eerie feeling when you go into these places. And I know Jake had an interesting experience there. Um, that he's still kind of suffering from when we went there. Tell him about it, Jake. <laughs> I don't know what if, happened, Jake? I don't know if I'm still suffering from it, but I, I remember... Um, Let us be the judge of that. Yeah. We'll <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, we were walking around the Serpent Mounds, and I bent down there, and I felt like like almost like a like I pulled a muscle in my back, but it, it didn't feel like, uh, like a pulled muscle. It was really strange, um, but I never felt anything like it, but I, it was like something had like poked me in the back while we were walking around the serpent mounds. And I, I remember like, okay, that's odd. We're, we're probably walking around some pretty, you know, dark and heavy areas. So I, you know, I, I prayed and, and it didn't really bother me afterwards, but I remember that, um, when we were there, like I, I felt like a jab in my back. Um, and no, it wasn't John poking me or anything, but you know, <laughs> at least not that time. But. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's crazy too. We went around this area, and I don't know what this is. This, I've never seen anything like it before in my life. But ninety nine percent of the houses in that area had black pentagrams on them all over the place. I, I mean, you you know you know oh, what yeah, I'm talking that, about. That was so weird. We we were looking up online. What does it mean to have all these black stars all across the front of your house? Um, and we were just driving all all through these kind of back roads in Ohio, and and it just felt like a really like the area was so beautiful. Um, it felt like we were driving through the Shire or something like from Lord of the Rings, <laughs> the Shire, right? 
but these houses seemed so just eerie. Like the whole atmosphere was so eerie. It felt like we were in Witch Central. Mm -hmm. Talking to John about that, like if these places attracted the natives and or the Nephilim tribes to build these burial mounds or, you know, to make these areas a, a focal point for their worship, it's probably the same case today with those who are involved in the esoteric religions and witchcraft and Satanism. It probably draws them like a magnet. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were many uh, people involved in witchcraft and involved in the worship of dark forces who today that are living, that are drawn to areas like that. You know, just hearing, Joseph, you know, as you talk about how, you know, you sense something different in these areas. And, you know, I don't know if me pulling a muscle in my back is necessarily a spiritual attack. It might have been. Um, but it went away. The pain went away after I, you know, I prayed. And, and you know, it, you know, it's just, it's interesting. And I think there is something to these areas that probably do draw those who are involved in the, you know, worship of dark forces and Satan and, and it draws them like magnets. Um, so, you know, do you know of any of cases like that today, Joseph, of people who, you know, do practice, you know, ancient for forms of the native religion or place, things like that, that are drawn to these areas for their worship purposes? Oh, absolutely. You know, just like, uh, you know, anytime creator makes a move, trickster makes a counter move. And, you know, that, that's something that if you ever read L.A.'s book, The Cosmic Chess Match, uh, that, that, that concept is so true in that, you know, God does something and Satan does something to try to counter that. It's like a, like, like a chess game. Well, in, in the same manner that there's a revival uh, of the spirit, there's a revival taking place among Native people uh, that was prophesied 42 years ago uh, and that started to see, bear fruit two years ago. Just like there's this awakening that's taking place uh, with spirit-filled Native believers, that awakening is also uh, is going across the, the land. Uh, we see it, you know, with the Native people who aren't believers, uh, but who are going back to, to, you know, traditional ways of worship for their tribes. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's really the, the traditions have gotten mixed in with other things. Uh, they're not the purest form of what they once were. I know some people who who think that they're you know walking in the tradition, their ancient traditions of their tribe, uh, when it's the farthest thing from that. Uh, but for the most part, what you're going to see at places like Serpent Mountain and stuff uh, is, is the New Age crowds. Uh, they've really been drawn. Uh, you know, they, they're some of them believe this is you know the, the age of Aquarius is what they believe um, that this is a time of enlightenment and all this. And this started happening right around the whole Mayan calendar date. Uh, thing, you know, where people thought the world was going to end. And that's not what the Mayan calendar said at all. Uh, nowhere in the Mayan calendar, the Mayan Incan calendar, did it say that the world was ending. So these people started getting together uh, for this, you know, so there's a new age awakening that, that started taking place. Uh, back in 1987 was the first really large uh, group of new age people that came to Serpent Mound. Uh, it was called the Harmonic Convergence. And, and so this, the fascination with, with the mounds and these ancient earthworks among the New Age circles, that's when it started happening, uh, right, right after 1987. Now in 2011, right there at Serpent Mound, uh, Mayan priests came uh, and, they, and there was a, a bringing together of the 13 crystal skulls. Uh, and the purpose of bringing together the 13 crystal skulls and all the chanting and mediums and spiritists and all these people that came there together, uh, they believed that, that what they were doing, their purpose was to ignite uh, paranormal power at that site. Uh, now, you know, we don't need to be igniting any type of paranormal anything, uh, no matter where we're at. Uh, I, we just went through... Back in October, this, this month, October 13th and 14th, uh, here on the reservation at White Earth, uh, there was a paranormal conference that was on the reservation. And from the moment the conference started, uh, you know, and they've got summoning and, and you know, Ouija boards and, you know, doing all sorts of things, paranormal and this and that. Uh, from the moment that conference started on this reservation and those doors, those spiritual doors started to be opened, within four days, we had 10, 10 
suicides, uh, six ODs, all within a time period of just four days. You know, so these these spiritual doors, when they're open, you know, it, it's to, to think that all these people came here to Serpent Mound, right there to Ohio, and that these Mayans came all the way down from Central America. You know, the, this is where this is where the serpent religion originated, the the Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Right? And so so all these guys come up, they bring together thirteen crystal skulls to ignite a paranormal power. You know, so that's one root gateway that was open there. So we have you know gatherings that take place there every year. As a result, unfortunately, the people who who run the park, uh, they're seeing big money in this because New Agers have money. Uh, and so they're starting to host more and more new age things to bring in the tourist dollars. Uh, it, now the native tribes are not happy about that. Uh, even the, the, especially the traditionals, you know, so whether you're a believer as a native person or whether you're traditional as a native person, the traditionalists are really having problems with the new agers coming and commandeering these sacred sites. One perfect example is in 2012 at Serpent Mound, uh, there's a group called the United Collective or Unite the Collective. And they brought hundreds of these things called organites. Uh, and these organites, it's just they make them in these little muffin pans. And it's a blend of resin, metal shavings, and quartz crystals. And they believe that they can ignite and, you know, uh, amplify energy and all these things uh, with these things called organites. Well, these people from the United Collective came to the Serpent Mound and buried hundreds of these all throughout the length of the serpent. Um, now, as far as I know, nobody's gotten in trouble for it, but that that is that is viol that's violating the law. It's desecrating a sacred site. Um, the native people really got upset by that, especially the Shawnee Nation. The Shawnee are the current caretakers uh, of that site, which, by the way, the chief of the Shawnee said is the same thing they that they're not the ones who built it. Um, so you've got a lot of a lot of focus from the New Agers on these sacred mounds, on these sacred sites. They are doing ceremonies. I guarantee you that as we're coming into these uh, unholy days of, of the kingdom of darkness, you're going to find ceremonies, candlelit ceremonies, and things like this happening at these places. When we were there for a Serpent Mound Conference with LA, and we were outside praying. I absolutely believe that that was a spiritual attack. Uh, a lot of times in the physical, we'll manifest what's happening in the spirit world. Uh, and, and we've got to always be armored up. Uh, and, and I'm sure you armored up, but you know that there's one part of the armor of God that it doesn't mention, and that's our back. You know, but there's a verse that says that the glory of the Lord, that the glory of Creator is our rear shield. You know, so always remember that when you're armoring up and going into places like this, uh, that you'd be pray prayed up from head to toe all, all over the place. So, Jake must have forgot that glory. You forgot that glory, Jake. You should have put it on, man. <laughs> the back of my right there. <laughs> so there, there's a video that Ellie Marzuli has that when we were praying, uh, and I, I had a shofar, uh, or, or no, it wasn't my shofar. Somebody had brought a shofar, and, and I felt like I needed to blow the shofar because at this conference there was a mixed bag. Uh, there were some people there. There was you know, people that had infiltrated from, from local covens and different groups. And in the video, I'm praying, I'm about to blow the shofar, and there's a woman who starts manifesting, like big time manifesting. Uh, the, the more intense the prayers got, the more the facade started to fall. And when I blew the shofar, uh, she literally, in the video, you see her come off of her feet into the air and fly backwards. Uh, that really freaked a lot of people out. There was a lot of people who'd never seen anything like that. Um, I'm trying to get a, a hold of the copy of the video from LA. He's got a copy of it and Russ Dizdar has a copy of it. So just be careful, all that to say, be careful when you go to these sites, uh, because now even more so the new agers are, are charging things. They're putting, uh, energies and prayers, just like we can pray over things, just like, um, you know, uh, Peter prayed over, you know, the, the handkerchiefs, you know, the, the silk cloths and people got healed. You know, that is a concept of charging and they do that. Uh, with charms and amulets and spells and all that. Uh, and now that there's more of a concerted effort of the kingdom of darkness coming against people of the kingdom of light, we have to we have to be ready more than ever now, uh, as we've seen, even with something as simple as, hey, let's do a show about Serpent Mound. And then I get sick, then bam, you get poisoned. You know, and we see these attacks, you know, on, on believers just at an unprecedented pace. Uh, so be careful when you go to places like this. 
Most definitely, man. And, you know, we it's crazy because, you know, I've encountered some pretty wild things in, in my life and some of the most eerie places that I've ever been. Um, you know, there's there's always an ancient significance to the places, almost always. And, you know, you know one of the most haunted houses I ever uh, went to was actually my grandfather's old place. He was a Cherokee, Cherokee Indian, but he was, he wasn't a believer. I mean, he, he, um, I mean, I, I, I don't really want to just call him out like that. Cause I love my grandpa. He was really always good to me, but he was involved in a lot of these things, but it had been going on in that area where he was at for a long, long time. And, um, it's, it was crazy. It was probably one of the most haunted places. And then down in South Texas, uh, I used to find arrowheads. I'd just kick them up on my way home everywhere I went, uh, find old ancient little pot. I mean, I was a young kid and I, I remember having like two huge bags full of just ancient artifacts that I just found kicking, kicking up the dust on my way home from school. And that was one of the most haunted places. I think somebody wrote a book about it and I can't remember exactly what they called it, but it was down in the South Texas area. You have Santa Ria that goes on there. Mm-hmm. You have um, these ancient sites where things are sacrificed. And even like on Halloween on Samhain, our donkey got sacrificed in our like a hundred yards from our backyard was sacrificed and all the bones were laid out in a pentagram. And um, yeah. Yeah, just crazy stuff, man. And, and, and you know, definitely Serpent Mounds has got that feeling. And you're right about being prayed up. People have asked, is it okay to bring my children there? And I would say, you know, visiting places like that is great. You just definitely need to be a cover for your family and pray over them for any of that. I mean, I pray over my children every night. I mean, I pray over my family every night uh, to keep my house a safe haven. Because just like you, Joseph, uh, we experience uh, curses from the enemy. We experience all these different things. And being praying over your your yourself and your house is so important no matter what because anytime you put yourself out there anytime you put yourself out there you become a target and especially when you're entering in these places these demons know you who know who you are people don't believe that that's possible oh, yeah. they know you you know and they, especially they know you i'm sure by now as much as you've exposed on this stuff yeah they they, they definitely the kingdom of dark is is absolutely a work man and you know things like the serpent mound they were built to last um the you know the, the serpent mound itself was made with a layer of stone clay and then ashes covered with rocks and clay soil so it made it water resistant and then and then it, it, so these things are, are here for for a reason uh there's now there's two different uh, uh that i've heard two different stories as to the meaning of, you know, some people say, well, look at the snake, it's swallowing an egg. Um, th- I've heard two different trains of thoughts from native people, from elders, uh, about the serpent mound itself. Uh, one of them is that, you know, it's a serpent uh, devouring an egg. Um, and I've heard some really interesting on that, uh, especially like Genesis uh, 3.17, or I'm sorry, Genesis 3.15, which says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It'll bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, so is this is this Nephilim architecture that is a throwback to the serpent eating the seed, devouring the seed, uh, which is what it's always tried to do throughout the history of the Jewish people in an attempt to wipe out the, the possible Mashiach, uh, the Messiah to come. You know, so, so was there some Nephilim knowledge uh, about that? Uh, the, o- the other other explanation that, that I've heard, and this is from a lot of the, the ancient stories, is that it's the it's the story of the birth of the world. Uh, and if I, I wish there was a way that we could pull a, a picture up so you could see it, uh, but the the depictions or the stories that I've heard uh, is that, and this is from a Lenny Lenape man, that in the oral tradition, that triangle you see that's the that's the serpent's mouth, uh, it actually represents a womb. And then you see the earth being birthed out of that. Uh, and the three coils, uh, which they do line up with Orion, uh, represent Orion. And then the small coils at, at where the tail is represents the path of the celestial bodies that are that are currently uh, uh, in around us. So we, we have two different two different thought patterns as, as to what it could be. Uh, if if you think of it as a as a, you know this. Uh, cosmic birth of the world uh, belief, uh, and, and you look at the depiction of what 
the Earth looks like coming out of coming out of this womb is kind of interesting. Uh, the also also the other is the possibility of you know the Nephilim knowledge of that Genesis thirteen uh, verse uh, about about the the serpent and the seed. You know, is that prophetic? Um, most most archaeologists have said that uh, oh that this was built by the Fort Ancient culture uh, around one thousand fifteen hundred A.D. Uh, but there's been new carbon dating that's been done uh, on the Serpent Mound, and it shows a date of anywhere from 300 to 400 BC. Uh, so again, that puts us right around that same timeline uh, of, of of giants, you know, coming out of Canaan, uh, you know, migration waves coming here into this land, uh, establishing villages and cities, and building these these mound structures. Uh, so. And, and, and has evidence been found of skeletons in the mounds? Yes, uh, there have been burials uh, that were disturbed and, and uh, seven foot to eight foot tall skeletons uh, have been exhumed uh, from here. Uh, there's one particular one, it's in the historical collections of Noble County, uh, Ohio uh, from 1872. And it's talking specifically about the Serpent Mound uh, and where they found the remains of three skeletons uh, that measured at least eight feet in height. Uh, and uh, they had double teeth in the front as well as the back of the mouth, upper and lower jaw. Uh, and so uh, there, there are written accounts of, of what's been buried here. Also other archaeologists of the time uh, that also had um, uh, discoveries made uh, based on, you know, people accidentally digging or purposely digging. Uh, but so, so we, find, uh, we find this whole plethora of people that are drawn to these sites uh, but I think that there's definitely, since it's something so ancient and it was built to last, uh, is it something for uh, the star people? You know, was, was there a return of the star people and this being an indicator or a marker uh, of some sort? Uh, Jake was talking about the New Agers, uh, and I, I was doing some digging around, and in Barbary Castle, which is Wilshire, uh, in Wilshire, England, in August 5th, 1999, and I've got a picture of this. You can Google it. Google Crop Circle Serpent Mound, uh, Wiltshire, England. So August 5th, 1999, a crop circle appears in England that is the exact same shape as the Serpent Mound in Ohio. Within seven days, uh, there was a new moon and a solar eclipse. There was also the, the Poseidon meteor shower taking place at the same time. Uh, at the same time, August 11th, so this is August 11th, you have a new moon, solar eclipse, the Poseidon meteor shower. On August 11th, at the Giza Pyramid, uh, there was a ceremony uh, that was called the Dark Mother Ceremony, uh, and they call it the right to open the passage. Uh, it's, it's, it's occult uh, knowledge, Illuminati, uh, and it has to do with, with the Eye of Horus. Uh, but they, the attempt was to open a passage, quote-unquote, uh, into the lower fourth dimension, uh, and this is where the ley lines come in. Uh, that the specific purpose of the ceremony that was being done at Giza was to open the passage to the lower fourth dimension, so that the energy could be directed to the ley lines of the earth. So, uh, so that that's going back to what you were talking about, John, uh, with the ley lines. Very interesting. I, I read it like I, was, I keep mentioning this book, but the fingerprint of the gods in the first two chapters, they have these maps, these ancient maps. One was actually one that uh, the Navy used to use, and, and it has these ley lines lined out um, on this map. And a lot of the uh, I guess if you look at that map, I kind of like went over it and kind of put it over the top of a map. It's interesting because you find a lot of military bases on some of these ley lines. You find Catholic churches on a lot of these ley lines, just kind of built over ancient sites. Have you experienced, you know, here in the in the America, Americas, are there Catholic churches built all over a lot of these ancient uh, native sites? Yes, there are. The the not only over if you look at all the central, if you look through Mexico, Central America, a lot of the pyramid sites. Uh, the Catholic Church made makes a concerted effort to find these places that are quote unquote gateways or doorways according to the indigenous people of that land. Uh, you find this all throughout Peru. You find it uh, in Mexico. One of the largest gates or portals. There's a, there's a church built right on top of it, um, which also has tunnels going underground. Uh, here in the Americas, you know we all hear about the the Standing Rock protests. 
Uh, and I just got to say, somebody posted about how the protesters left a million dollars worth of trash. Uh, I was there uh, as veterans. We were planning a complete cleanup of that camp. Uh, but the government gave no notice as to when they were coming in uh, to land that didn't belong to them uh, to remove everybody. So the, the the debris and everything that was left there was not as a result of anything of, of people being not environmentally conscious. Uh, so I just want to set that record straight. Uh, so back to the, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church on the Apache Reservation, uh, you don't hear about this. You know, we, we hear about protests everywhere. Uh, the Apache's sacred mountain, their most sacred mountain, the Vatican somehow got permission permission from the U.S. government to build a observatory on top of this mountain. And of all the names that they choose, the acronym for this observatory is Lucifer. So you know the the Apache people are still protesting it. It's their most sacred mountain. Why? They say, according to their oral tradition, that this is where they would communicate with the gods. This is where they would communicate with the star beings and the people from the heavens. Uh, and this is exactly where the Catholic Church comes and builds this observatory. Why do you think that is? To me, it's obvious that they, I mean, they're in one accord with all those things. To me, I mean, when I see what they've got going on, of course, to people that haven't looked into the Catholic origins and looked into the rituals and looked into the reasons behind them, it would seem like a mystery, but um, to us, obviously, it's it makes a lot of sense, you know, uh, yeah. why they would do this stuff because they are trying to channel these things, and that's why the militaries build bases on these things. They're trying to channel these things mm -hmm. and uh, channel whatever whatever is coming through there. I know in different uh, religions and cultures, they want to call it whatever, whether they want to call it the Mahat, a universal mind, whether they want to call it. Um, chi or whatever they want to call it some some places don't really describe an entity a lot attached with it more of an energy mm -hmm. uh, but yeah it, it's it's pretty amazing and um you know I, I guess when i when i see when i see all these ancient societies and i see a lot of because i mean when you look at the mounds they uh obviously had some kind of um you know, we, we talked about the agenda. They did it. You said they built it underneath the constellation Draco. It's built on ley lines. It's built with the solstice markers. Um, this this stuff ties in with every ancient civilization in the world, and to have it so scattered all over the world that these these things happen. And I know I remember you talked before because a lot of people believe that the Native Americans were mound builders, but you, I believe, you have told me before that that's not the case. Um, that's, that's usually not what they do. Right. A lot, a lot of the tribes, when, when you ask the elders who built the mounds, uh, typically the answer that you're going to hear is we didn't build them. Uh, they were here when we already got here or the giants built them. Uh, now that's not to say that native people did not build mounds, uh, to try to copy, uh, what they had, what they were seeing around them. And we do have evidence of that. And then we see mounds that are smaller, not these great stature, uh, or size of, of mounds that, that you typically see like in the ancient earthworks. Uh, so, so although there is mound building that was done uh, by native tribes, uh, for the most part, uh, not to the stature of, of you know, what, this Nephilim architecture, this, these gigantic earthworks uh, that were built long before, you know, th it's 300, 400 BC, um, any of the other uh, tribes that have ever even been in this area. Uh, so, that, that's the that's typically what you're going to hear from native people uh, concerning the mounds. Uh, but but regardless of that, the native people are also going to be fierce protectors uh, of these sites of these sacred sites uh, because that I mean that's that's part of the part of the code of Indian living uh, is being protectors of these sacred grounds uh, regardless of who built them. Uh, and and that you know I, that's one that that's definitely something that Nagpra has done. Uh, the Native American Grave and Repatriation Act, uh, when the government put that into law, uh, that created a standing force of people uh, that will that'll protect these places. Uh, at the same time, you know, obviously we can't you go digging into burials or, or anything like that uh, to find out what's under there or, or anything like that. We very much uh, 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 speak against that. You don't want to open doors that you don't need to open. Um, but to answer your question, for the most part, most Native people will tell you that they, they're not the ones who built these mounds. They're, now, they're not. The 
Now, when we're looking at these mounds, um, of course, um, when we were out on the site, um, whoever's putting up kind of the tourist signs and stuff, um, they're attributing a lot of these mounds to the native people. Um, who Who's kind of disseminating that information? And um, because, I mean, why, why are they saying there that the natives have made it if most of the tribal uh, people that are being asked are denying any involvement in the mounds themselves? Uh, I've, I've never quite understood that, Jake. <laughs> uh, even when, when I was taking anthropology and archaeology courses and uh, and, and doing my graduate studies, and uh, I was just floored at how few or, or how little uh, the oral tradition of the native people was even considered as a valid source uh, for you know explaining archaeological finds or artifacts or you know any, anything that was discovered by academia. Um, I was actually I was actually told by my professor that the native oral tradition uh, doesn't hold any weight. Uh, because it wasn't in writing, because we didn't write anything down. Well, the Mayans and Incans, uh, they did. The Mayans especially wrote a lot of their history down, uh, despite you know the Catholics uh, coming in and burning scrolls and untold, uh, who knows, years, centuries worth of, of history of, of ancient America. Uh, they're still writing that, that's been left behind. The oral tradition isn't just a telephone game story. Where one native, you know, tells it to another native, and then by the time the fifth native hears it, the story's changed. Uh, the traditional storytellers are, are chosen from birth. Uh, it, it still happens this way; they're chosen from birth, um, <clears throat> and, and then and then picked uh, which one has a, a propensity for memorization, and then those are trained uh, to be the storytellers. They're trained this way because they cannot add a word to a story and they can't take one away. And they have to tell the story the same way it was told uh, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, or 2,000 years ago. So the integrity of the story doesn't change. When we look at how um, the American government, uh, the U.S. government, has kind of, in a way, created their own version of Native history, um, and with some of your work kind of showing uh, the, the idea that a lot of the Native tribes migrated from the Middle East have lineage back to the tribes of Israel. Um, what do you see is kind of the purpose be be behind this false history that so that I remember hearing growing up in school in the history textbooks. Oh, you know, Christopher Columbus got over here and he found the natives here and they'd been here all along and there's <laughs> no way that they, you know, so, so what is kind of the agenda behind this false narrative this false history that's being told about the natives um, here in the Americas. And, you know, what, what, what do you have to say about what's kind of being perpetrated in schools, in history books um, that flat out deny the idea that native tribes migrated over from the Middle East? Um, you know, it, you know, what is What is the purpose of this false narrative? I, I, I often rack my brain trying to figure that out. And now I don't think that all tribes, uh, have have a Hebraic origin. Uh, I don't believe that all tribes have have that Semitic uh, genetics, uh, but I do. Uh, I mean, the research does really point to some tribes uh, that not just through linguistics, but through cultural traditions, through spiritual traditions, uh, and even now through DNA. National Geographic just did an article a few years ago uh, talking about the origin of of some tribes and the native DNA. And the, and the markers that were showing up were Middle Eastern markers. Uh, so, and this is mostly tribes that were on the East Coast uh, and also, also in the Southwestern part of the country. Uh, cover up why the, the blatant, yeah, I, I can't even begin to, to understand. Uh, there is, for example, there is absolute concrete archeological evidence that the Mayans and the Incans uh, were all the way up through Florida uh, even as far as Okmulgee, Georgia, and going into Ohio, uh, there is a definite Mayan Incan influence uh, in architecture, in religion, in the art, in the iconography. Uh, you definitely see the Central American motifs, religion, spiritual way, cultures, and traditions. Why do archaeologists deny it? I don't know. Do they do they want to deny? Uh, I guess they don't want, want to say, oh, well, you know what? These people aren't actually immigrants from south of the border. They've been here longer than anybody else have. Uh, I, I don't know. That's just me being cynical. 
you know, but it proves that there was a presence here of indigenous people from south of the border. Uh, it also disproves a lot of the uh, the theories of academia. I mean, there is a, a complete blatant denial of the First Nations oral tradition when it comes to the giant tribes. Uh, even though there's article upon article, even though there's evidence upon evidence, it gets buried, it gets declared a hoax, it gets disseminated. You know, uh, Okmulgee National Monument, uh, which is in Macon, Georgia, there's a large earthworks there, 40-foot temple mound, uh, the lesser mound, funeral mounds, burial mounds. Uh, that was one place where Creek elders uh, that I spoke to who, when they were young, they remember the giant skeletons that were on display right there at the National Park behind glass. Uh, and then when NAGPRA was put into effect, that's when the park system took the bones from, from behind the glass and put them in boxes and storage, basement, I don't know where they went. Um, but one particular Muscogee Creek elder told me he remembered as a child seeing the giant skeletons on display. Uh, and then they were, because they found three of them, three giant skeletons that were in one of the burial mounds at Okmulgee, Georgia, in Macon, Georgia. Uh, where did those skeletons go? Who knows? But the people remember, the Creek elders remember. I think from a biblical standpoint, uh, the reason is that if we validate, if we're able to validate these stories of the giants and these oral traditions of the giants and validate these artifacts, not as, ho not as hoaxes, like for example, that lance that I have, I have undeniable scientific proof that this lance was not made in the Americas. It was made in the Middle East. The next step is getting the carbon dating on it. You know, so if we can prove and back it up with science that these stories are valid, then it also brings a validity to the biblical account of the Nephilim and the star people. You know, so there is a, a very deliberate um, attack on covering and just putting a blanket over anything that has to do with these things. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you obviously they have to push their narrative of evolution and with the ideas of Nephilim being here and the ideas of uh, civilizations being here longer than what they say, um, just the diff you know, and plus they have to push the, the agendas to be able to cause this all to divide against each other and all to have issues with each other. And if you don't know your history, then you're doomed to repeat it. You know, if, if, if the people, uh, which I believe I, I'm a hundred percent now that now that we've started this documentary that I've heard from you, there's, there are tribes that are from Israel. There are people from Israel in the Americas. If you can push down their culture and not let them know who they are, it's so easy for them to fall for deception. And, um, and, and, and to not, you know, when you don't know who you are, it's hard to grasp onto the idea of, of God. You know, when you, the native Americans hate Jesus, they hate Christianity. And most of them do, uh, that aren't, that haven't been awakened yet because those are the people that killed them. Those are the people that came over here and did these things. But when you can push your history down, you can push your history away. You can push the history of the Nephilim. You can push all these away. Evolution is propagated. I was going to play a short video real quick, just to give us a little break that I, it talks about a giant skeleton that's been found. It's only about, I don't know, it's like a minute or two long, but that way it give us a chance to get a glass of water real quick. But it's interesting, but it shows how skeletons get covered up because there are several newspaper publications that actually covered this skeleton, and it comes from an old ancient, uh, not American uh, native, but an Indian over from India, Indian story. And uh, I'm going to play it real quick. It's short, but it, you know, it kind of gives you the idea of the idea that these skeletons are pushed away but history you know history talks about these things there's ain't there's old uh newspapers that you can go through archives in america of finding giants that are 16 feet 20 feet tall uh but how does academia explain it away well they didn't know how to measure things back then yet they were doing all these um amazing medical procedures they're doing all these other things they could build amazing buildings that we don't even build now we see these uh, these awesome masonic architectures and stuff like that but they couldn't measure a giant that they found in the ground they couldn't use a tape measure but they could build all these other things so when they found that 16 foot 20 foot giant they just didn't know what they're talking about but you see this stuff i'm gonna play this real quick give us a chance to get a drink and for you guys to watch it short and it's but it's good so i'm gonna play it if you don't mind and then uh, we can comment a little bit more about some of this stuff and also after that the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old. 
men of renown. This is John Pounders with Now You See TV. According to numerous newspaper articles written in 1934, a giant ape-like skeleton measuring 32 feet in length was discovered in Jubalpur, India. There are a few different news archives that cover this story. This one, published by a newspaper called The Argus, states that a skeleton 31.5 feet long was discovered and believed to be that of a giant ape. It was said to be discovered by a farmer that saw bones protruding out of the sand. When attempts were made to remove the skeleton failed, the chief of state was called in. It took three men to lift only the leg bones, which alone measured 10 feet. This one by the West Australian tells the same story. This one in the Sydney Herald. The most interesting thing about this location and sheer size of this skeleton is this. In Hindu ancient history, there is a giant named Hunaman that has an ape-like face and is the leader of a group of forest dwellers. At the temple of Lapakshi, there are giant footprints that are more than four foot long. In a height to foot ratio, this would lead us to assume that the giant was 30 feet tall or more. Many believe that this is the same giant that was found in 1934. Here is a comparison chart to show you what 30 feet looks like to us. I have King Og of Bashan, Goliath, and a six foot tall man to just show you the size of this thing. If you would like to learn more about this and other things similar, check out. Anyways, yeah, that, I just wanted to play that short video to kind of talk about and show the idea that they are, they are, they are covering this up. That that colony was actually a British owned colony. And there's reports, other articles that I found after that they took that skeleton uh, to United Kingdom and placed it in London somewhere. And, and now it's never to be seen again. But this is, you know, I found uh, several different articles. Those are just a few of the ones that I found on that video. But it's the same kind of stuff that you see here. And uh, it amazes me that they do, they do this. To, they'll do anything to cover up the truth, anything. I mean, if we, if we knew as a society in America, I mean, America's a melting pot. We have people from every country in the world here. But if we knew, if our education system taught us that there were giants here, there were giants here, there were ancient civilizations that worshipped these serpents, there were sites that line up with these constellations, there's all these different things going on. If we knew about those things which we do but the the education system's never going to touch it this would not be the same uh america that we live in people would see that there's a spiritual side to everything so absolutely yeah. you know i i with my question before uh, about how what's this the purpose of this historical narrative um that's being pushed um it seems to me like they seem to deny um the idea that the ancient world was more traveled than we we would think. Um, I know uh, I I heard before that there, it's possible that uh, King Solomon even did did business with people in the Americas, um, traveling over and getting the cedars of Lebanon um, type you know materials from the Americas, and that. There's also ancient Hebrew, you know, hieroglyphs and stuff that have been found in the Americas. But we're being told that, that the earliest, you know, travelers to reach the Americas were possibly, you know, Viking cultures or, you know, you know, even even the story of Christopher Columbus being the one who discovered the Americas. <laughs> but the idea that people in the ancient world traveled the world. Um, to a much greater extent than we really know, and that the, the the cultures that were here in the Americas very likely did have a relationship with the rest of the world at large, um, and and even you know tracing back to some of the the Semitic nations that you know migrated over here and can trace their lineage back to um, the Middle Eastern peoples. Um, you know, it's just it's just interesting to me that. It seems like the world was so isolated. At least that's what we we've been taught and told. Um, but if these giant tribes and if even these native tribes that traveled across the world um, after the these 
giant Nephilim tribes first came and built these mounds, it seems to me that they they would have been able to travel the world in a greater way than I feel like I've been taught in school growing up, um, and and that they haven't been in the Americas for hundreds of thousands of years, which is what I feel like I've been I've been taught is that two separate people groups kind of um, landed one in the Americas and some in Eurasia, and they kind of sprung up separately um, without any any relation to one another. And, and I feel like that's an error, um, that there was no connection between those who were in the Americas and those who were in, uh, the Middle East and, and Asia. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the, uh, up, up in, in the, the great lakes, region, region, there's a museum and this, you know, this is the region where, where this Nephilim lance was found. And uh, a friend of mine had sent me a picture. He was in the museum and there was a, a stone tablet with writing on it. And in, in the, the, the depiction, the little plaque, it says unknown writing. And when I saw it, just from my studies, I, I was about 90% sure that it was Minoan. Um, I took the picture and started doing some comparisons with the letters. Uh, and it, is, it was Minoan writing. Uh, the Minoans, uh, in some, some of the ancient writings, were, were described as giants. Uh, again, we, you know, we have an artifact uh, from that region. We have oral tradition that talks about the giants mining um, copper and uh, I can't remember what other uh, mining mostly copper uh, and, and iron from from that area. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, copper and bronze. Uh, and the the estimates of where that where that copper went, where what was mined went, nobody knows. Uh, but we do, if you look at the timeline of, of the copper mines that were here in the Americas, where the native oral tradition from different tribes, I mean, the Cherokees have stories of the people of the scroll that had mines in the southeast. Uh, and then you've got the stories of the giants that were mining uh, metals up in the, the great, in the, in the Lake Superior region. And we see all this, uh, all these metals coming out of Amikakia. Uh, in my language, over the land, over, over America. Uh, and then all of a sudden we have the Bronze Age uh, that begins in Europe. Uh, I, th- I think I'm trying to find the connection between the two is something I've been researching and digging into. Uh, but the, there's definitely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, there, were, there was connections here with, with Asians, uh, with Vikings, with Phoenicians, with Minoans. Uh, uh, there was much interaction in the ancient world. Uh, why, again, does this want to be, su- why, why does academia want to suppress this? Why is it just seen as fairy tales or myths? Uh, I don't know. But the, the evidence to me is overwhelming uh, of there being contact here from ancient times. Uh, there have been archaeological sites in the Middle East where they have found artifacts that came from here and vice versa. Artifacts found, found here that were from the Middle East, like the Decalogue Stone. Uh, in Ohio with the Hebrew writing and, and Moshe uh, on there, the Back Creek Stone, it's got uh, uh, Hebrew as well. You know, we find Paleo-Hebrew uh, all throughout the land here, uh, but yet there's just this incessant drive to keep this knowledge from being put out there or you're labeled as conspiracy or uh, or you're some sort of whack job. Um, and really, uh, <laughs> the whack job, the, the, that should be those guys who think that they can pull one over on us. Yeah, and it's true. And, the, and you know, the the thing about it is the information is available to people that want to study. But the and one thing that they've really pushed on people is pop culture. It makes people really stupid and makes people want to act stupid. You have uh, that's their goal is to just push. I mean, you look at the teenagers that are growing up today and the teenagers that were I grew up in the 80s and 90s. Um, I just remember how pop culture was and how the the whole idea was just to live life don't worry about all this stuff have fun don't worry about it and now it's even worse you're just staring at your phone all day but i, I did a, a a whole presentation and a whole um i've been researching this for a book i'm writing about ancient technologies and stuff you see these ancient technologies that have been around for thousands of years thousands of years you know nuclear weapons you see all these different uh, different things that uh, I put pointed out in this in this teaching that I did called Ancient Watchers. Uh, I believe I can't remember exactly what I called it, Ancient Watchers something, but I give proof of all the different scientists that have 
been um, channeling these entities to create these things that have already existed in the Vedic text, which is one of the most ancient texts in the world. You see these things that are proof. There's proof there, in my opinion. It's not evidence. It's proof. Like anybody that can read and look at it can see this stuff. But if academia doesn't push it, if the news doesn't push it, if Hollywood doesn't push it, like you said, it's a conspiracy theory and you're an idiot for reading it. But these ancient, these texts are ancient, thousands of years old. And these these stories of the people that were actually here are thousands of years old. They tell something. And yet, as a whole, America and all the really all the countries in the world, they want to believe their media, which are bought by a very the, the five percent of the people in the world are the richest people in the world. Maybe even one percent. I think it is now. They own these things. These same people own these media companies. These same people own this Hollywood company. They own the education industry, and they are controlling the education people get, and people are fine with it. I mean, obviously not people that listen to the show, but people that, um, you know, are listen to the, st the publications that you guys have and others like us, they are wanting to hear the truth. But as and the majority of people are closed off to this idea, and the information is readily available. And, and how do you wake people up like that? I don't know. I mean, I've never figured it out. 100% yet. I know we're getting to question time, but do you have any kind of uh, final kind of closing, not necessarily closing things, but things to say about these Nephilim mouths before we take questions from the audience? Uh, just, you know, uh, just if, if you're going to visit sites like these, uh, I mean, really what's coming to mind is be prayed up. Uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, we have to be prayed up all the time anyway, but when you know that you're going to a place that's an ancient site like this, uh, where there's so much speculation to be had, we don't really know what took place there, what's happened there. We only have, uh, you know, what's been passed down. Uh, you definitely want to be prayed up. You know, we battle not against flesh and blood. Uh, if you're a believer and you think that you don't need spiritual armor or spiritual warfare or that you're constantly covered by the blood of Jesus, uh, you, you, <laughs> you, re you really need to do some more uh, learning about spiritual warfare. Uh, there's a reason why we're given these weapons of warfare. I, I don't mean, I don't mean to laugh sarcastically, my brothers and sisters, for you not being taught. Uh, but you you really need to learn um, how to protect yourself, how to pray over yourself. Uh, I mean, you're just leaving yourself wide open. Uh, the the more uh, that the more that these times when the fires are coming uh, are happening, you know, these prophecies about end times, the more this type of knowledge is going to be uncovered. Uh, the more that that science is going to prove uh, what the native oral tradition has been saying for all along. Uh, the more documents, the more archaeology. These things have to be exposed to show us that we've all been lied to. There's a great deception that's been taking place. Uh, and it's just a matter of taking some time to research, to dig. Uh, and, and it's not for any other purpose other than some of us are called to expose the darkness, to expose these places, to expose the occult and what they're doing with places like this to have Nephilim architecture uh, or, or ceremonial grounds or what have you. Uh, but it's definitely a, a realm of um, it's ancient be protected, be prayed up, uh, and make sure that you're called to do these things. And and don't go to places like trying to pull down principalities and strongholds and and don't go picking fights uh, with with the with these forces that are there, these dark energies, these spirits, whatever you want to call them. Uh, don't don't go trying to incite a, a fight with them. It's it's not good uh, to do so. Even scripture tells us to resist the devil and he will flee. It doesn't even tell us to fight him. It says just to resist. So resistance is a show of force. Put your armor on, get ready for war, and let creator do the battling for you and continue exposing the, the darkness, which is what you guys are doing. So that, that's my last thought on that, um, John and Jake. Okay, well, I, that kind of, there's one of the questions from Nathaniel is, is, why is the host so worried about praying over themselves? The devil has no power <laughs> over us if we have Jesus. And you kind of answered that perfectly because <laughs> that, that's in... <laughs> And that, see, that's the thing. I've heard that from people before. And uh, one of the guys that I heard it from all the time, he used to, ha he's from here locally, he used to hassle me about it all the time. Why are you so focused on this stuff? Why don't you talk about the good things that God's done and stuff? Uh, come to find out, like less than a year later, the guy gets exposed by his wife because he's downloading all kinds of horrible kinds of different porn on his computer and mm -hmm. comes out, tells everybody he has this horrible addiction with it. And another person, they, you know, they, they have these major issues, psychological issues and stuff like that. And they broke down, had a complete meltdown and stuff. And so I, I can't help but think that maybe if they understood 
what it means to have spiritual warfare, what it means yeah. to put on the arm, uh, then that would not have happened to them. Instead of taunting people like us that actually talk about these things, it is important. It's important to pray over stuff. I mean, the enemy, the enemy's people, the the servants of the devil, they put a lot of time in putting these black magic rituals together. So mm-hmm. they sacrifice, they risk their freedom, they do all these things just so that they can put an incantation or put a spell or because they can, so they can get more power. But the children of God are, you know, when you talk about praying over yourself, praying over these things, they're like, oh, the devil has no power over me, you know, and it's just it's the same old story. And, and to tell you the truth, uh, I would be very careful saying anything like that. The devil certainly that's some spiritual pride right there to say the devil's got nothing on you. He, it is you know? <laughs> a powerful ancient entity that has caused many, many men, many, many angels to stumble. And I would be very careful about uh, accusing him or pushing anything against him and definitely pray because the one we have in us is greater than he is in the world, which is the devil. Yes. But when you're taunting and saying things like that against people that are trying to expose the stuff and against against the entity himself, uh, it's almost like saying, hey, devil, come over here and try me. You know what I mean? It's not it's not a Martin Wise thing to do. So, yeah. Uh, I'll get into the questions now. That was one of the questions there. So I, I figured since you talked about it, we'll address that one first. So um, Plain Fire asks, uh, question for Chief Joseph. Is it true that the raised hand greeting was to identify oneself as a five, five-fingered five human? Uh, in some tribes, that was the tradition, especially among the Northeastern tribes. Uh, you know, the whole, you know, putting up your hand and saying how, uh, it was it was it was twofold. It was one showing that you didn't have that you weren't carrying a weapon. Uh, the other one was also to identify you from a distance uh, to see if you had five or six fingers on your hands. Uh, so it was it was a dual method. I don't know if it was the same for tribes uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, but for the most part in the no- northeastern tribes, Iroquois, uh, Mohawk, uh, Powhatan, uh, all the way down to the Cherokee, you know that whole uh, confederacy. Uh, of tribes that that was the the tradition yes i can't remember what the tradition uh what country the tradition is but they would show their middle finger when they went into a shop uh because if they were a thief their middle finger would get chopped off and so when they would go into the shop they would show their middle finger to show that they're not a thief or they haven't been there had their finger chopped off and it's just it made me think of that <laughs> I know there's no real connection there i'm sure but that's where we get the middle finger flipping people off from today so uh anyway okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah cot asks uh is there currently any known occult or supernatural activity or unexplained missing persons in the near vicinity of the serpent mound uh you know who would have the the best answer for that would be russ Dizdar. uh you know he he's a specialist he's a cr- uh, cult crime specialist uh, and I mean, he's really the one who, who can crunch the numbers on that stuff. Yeah. Ohio, right? uh, Do what? Yeah. Isn't he from there in Ohio as well? Yeah, he's from there in Ohio. Um, man, you talk about, you know, we, we've spent some time with him at his home. Uh, you, you just have to have a, an incredible man, mantle and anointing to see the things that this man has seen uh, to, you know, the FBI, and the CIA, they, they all consult him when it comes to SRA, satanic ritual abuse and occult crimes, uh, he has helped to rescue SRA victims. Uh, he helps, you know, with deprogramming them. Uh, and I mean, just, uh, you know, we were at his house a few months ago and, and he just gets a random picture and it's a kid in a cage, you know, and, and he's like, we've got to find this kid. He's somewhere around. Uh, so uh, I, I, that I wouldn't know, but it, Russ Dizdar would be the one to ask. I would defer to his expertise on any type of statistics of missing persons around Serpent Mound. I wouldn't be surprised. And I would say too, if you can't get a hold of Russ Dizdar, uh, William Dun- or uh, Thomas Dunn and Jared Cressman are friends of Russ Dizdar, and they've worked a few of these things with them. They're easier to access than Russ Dizdar because I know a lot of people yeah. tried to contact him and can't get a hold of him. But if you if you contact Thomas Dunn and Jared Cressman, uh, which we'll probably have on the show here for too long, they did a documentary called Detestable about uh satanic ritual abuse they would probably know those stats as well um if you can't get a hold of Dizdar, and so um yeah, yeah it, i don't know if you're familiar with them or not but they're friends uh mm, yeah, friends of his yeah they're friends of his um so cot asks uh, another question here 
Is there any oral tradition to explain what happened to the giant civilization? You, you already said, you already discussed that. Uh, you answered that question, I believe. But if you want to go ahead and answer it one more time for people that may not have been here. Yeah, the, the, the general consensus across the oral traditions of, of tribes, First Nations tribes, uh, that have stories of giants also have the same story uh, that of great flood or a great water came uh, and that the creator had sent. Uh, in a lot of the stories, it was after the people prayed uh, for some sort of, you know, deliverance, uh, you know, uh, get salvation from uh, from these giant tribes that were sadistic. They were, uh, you know, ritually uh, cannibalistic, delved into the occult. And in almost all the accounts, uh, it was a, a flood that came and wiped out the giants in their villages. There you go. Um you get here I'm trying to make sure I get all the questions that keep flying in from all angles here. Uh, so uh, another question, is there oral tradition relating the giants of old with the current sightings of the Ohio grassmen or Sasquatch of today? The, the Sasquatches, I, I, I believe that, you know, in all the native stories, uh, the, the different tribes names for Sasquatch uh, translates into like, you know, man eater or, or it's always something that's not good, uh, definitely not a benevolent thing. Uh, I think that the increase of the sightings that are taking place, especially like the one that was sought, I don't know if it's, if it's been declared authentic or a hoax or not. Uh, there was a white one that was filmed. Uh, that also ties into native prophecy, end time prophecy. Uh, but as far as the Sasquatches themselves, uh, in some stories, they're, they're a result of the star people. Uh, and human beings, uh, but in like among the Lakota, uh, I think his name's Joseph uh, Flying By. Uh, in their oral tradition, uh, the Sasquatches came from. As a result, there used to be a reptilian being uh, that, that's able to transform uh, its shape. Uh, so uh, I definitely think that there's a connection and there's a tie in, uh, and and you know the the stories yet to unfold on that. Uh, as I'm still collecting stories from the oral tradition of native tribes, uh, but but I, I'm, I'm pointing toward there's being a definite connection uh, between the star people and the Sasquatches. Um, another question was from Raymond, and he was asking if you could show the artifact, the spearhead that you have. I know you've showed it on one of your shows, on our shows before. I think the last one you came on, you showed it to us. But uh, if you have it nearby, can you show it? If not, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd have to go downstairs to get it. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about it. If you want to yeah. check back, I believe the last show that we did, uh, with I, the, uh, I can't remember. If you want to go get it, you can. It's up to you. I, I just can't, yeah, can't yeah. Remember. Go ahead and talk, and I'll go grab it real quick. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I'll go on to um, I'll go on to the next question real quick. Uh, while he's well, I'm gonna wait till he gets back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let him answer these questions. You guys don't want to hear from me tonight. You want to hear from Joseph Riverwind, and um, Jake's over there, sick, chilling in the corner there. What's up, Jake? Uh, <laughs> surviving. Survi <laughs> I'm sur survivor. Surviving's better than nothing, I guess. Yeah. Better to better survive than nothing. But anyways, yeah, it's it it um it's interesting about the we did a show in the FM. I can't remember the show we did with Joseph Riverwind where he brought out the spearhead. Um, but we've done several with uh, Chief Riverwind, and we're we're excited about it. But I know that uh, it's interesting when you talk about these um, traditions relating to giants of old with the current sightings of a grassman and Sasquatch. Uh, the video I showed earlier, the guy, the Hunaman God, Hunaman that was a um, half ape, half um, human type giant. Uh, he was the leader of a civilization of forest dwellers, and he was basically an underling of a god, small g, and one of the sons of the gods. And so he had a whole group of what they called forest dwellers, and they all looked like him ape-wise. He was one of the bigger ones. Uh, but it's interesting how that might relate as well to the Sasquatch. It, it kind of makes me wonder if Nephilim looked ape-like. You know, I'm sure they, you know, they had the elongated skulls, but, you know, their facial features, I'm wondering, you know, what, you know, when you grow to that extent and your just body grows and grows and grows, they were probably they had some probably pretty ugly mugs. I'm I'm guessing these giant <laughs> tribes were probably the ugliest. You know, <laughs> you don't even want to look at them type type people. You know, so yeah. You know, no wonder the natives didn't want to hang out with them. <laughs> <laughs> 
probably eat them anyway. Uh, so yeah, do you have the artifact? Mm hmm. All right, let's see it. All right, so here's the here's the point or the tip of it. And this thing's 15 pounds. Uh, it's actually more like around 24 pounds, 24 to 26 pounds. It's got a fine hammered edge. I don't know if you can see that it's like copper, bronze. Uh, and it is very long. With you a taper at the end. Pounds. You never know that it's 20 pounds by looking at it, because, but it's, bit, it's very dense. It is. It's very dense, very thick. It's copper, not stone. So, right. Interesting. And uh, I've got the exact measurements written down. I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but where it is. It is. Mark, where are the markings on it that show that it's uh, Middle Eastern? Oh well, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't markings. What what we did was, uh, and it pained me to do this, but uh, I had to. I had to take and cut off a little piece off the end here. And so that we actually sent a piece of the, the lance itself uh, to be analyzed. Hmm. And uh, and they analyzed it at the lab. They analyzed the metal itself. And the metal all came back Middle Eastern, uh, Turkey, uh, Judea area. Wow. Yeah. And what's this doing in the Great Lakes region? Especially with, you know, the native people up there didn't do this type of metalworking. They, they simply didn't. Interesting. All right. The next question is uh, from Quazanunian. Quazunian. Quazonian. Quazonian. I think I got that right. It says, all throughout the scriptures, Satan the tempter is called the serpent, while Christ himself likens himself to the serpent in John 3, 12 through 15. Now, I'm not sure what the question is. It seems more like a statement. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think that, that verse in John is a direct reference to the Torah, you know, where it had the, the snake on the pole. Um, but if they're trying to make some sort of inference, like, because I, I know the, that the Mormons believe that Yeshua and, and Hasatan are brothers, uh, which that is not biblical. Uh, Has, you know, Hasatan, the deceiver, Hallel in Hebrew, later named Lucifer, the Greek god of light, uh, is a created being and is not uh, equal or on par with the Messiah. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what that person, there really, really was no question in, in what they were saying, but we just had to make, make sure that people understand that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's if you, when you read the book of Enoch and you read a lot of these prophecies, you see that that's ex definitely not the case. I mean, I was reading the book right. of Enoch, messianic prophecies in the book of Enoch and they're amazing, outright amazing. And, um, it's interesting that there's a whole group of people denying the Messiah that used to love the Messiah and, and, and were called in through him. I don't know if you've seen that group of people that are doing that lately, uh, but they all claim to believe in these extra biblical texts and these Dead Sea Scrolls, but I don't see how they can uh, read the book of Enoch with and deny the Messiah. It's just it's nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, Allison asks, why did the giant tribes build the serpent mounds? Were they were where they were built? Why they built them where they were built? Uh, yeah. If if you notice, a lot of these places, uh, some of these ancient sites are built on ley lines. Uh, some of them are built like with the case of this serpent mound right near where this meteor struck. Uh, so you've got uh, a charging of the land. You've got uh, the stones that resonate. Uh, even uh, to some places, they they give off uh, magnetic uh, or even sound frequencies. Uh, so, you know, are these as a result of these impacts of these ancient sites? Uh, I believe that back in the ancient times, uh, people had, you know, whether people or, or whoever was wandering the earth, giants or whoever, uh, they had a much more heightened sense of connection with the land and with the earth. Uh, you know, even, even today in modern society, you know, we walk around with shoes on uh, and we're not grounded. We're not, you know, we're not connected uh, to the land that we walk on. And I believe that people were so sensitive back then to areas uh, that, you know, to them, let's say it was a ley line or, or a place where there is just a natural uh, uh, magnetics uh, taking place. Uh, and a person that was very sensitive 
would think, oh, th or they may even have a spiritual experience or think this is something special. This is sacred ground. I feel different here. Uh, and then it would be marked. And then from those markings, it would turn into, you know, a, 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 a sacred place, a place of worship or, you know, or a spiritual religious place. Uh, so not only that, but also the alignment of all these places. Uh, I, I have yet to find a mound uh, structure or mound site that doesn't correlate with some sort of star constellation, uh, you know, whether it's it's uh, Draco, like with the Serpent Mound, uh, or Orion, or the Pleiades. Uh, the you, you typically find those three throughout uh, mound structure uh, astronomy uh, placements. What's the significance of those particular constellations um, that you know of? Uh, well, the or, Orion in a lot of the traditional stories, and I mean, even, my, even my father, my grandfather told me that it was from from the warrior's belt, uh, which is what we call Orion, uh, from the warrior constellation, that it was from his belt that that's where the the star people came from. Uh, that was their point of, point of origin uh, in our oral tradition of, of where they would come from. Uh, the Pleiades, there's different different tribes have different stories about the Pleiades. Uh, I think that Devil's Tower in Wyoming is a very interesting one. Uh, the Devil's Tower, you know, it's called the Devil's Tower, but in the Lakota stories, uh, it was young Lakota girls that were escaping from a bear that was chasing them. And uh, as, they, as they got close to the monolith, uh, they began to pray. You know, they asked Wakantanka, uh, the, the great spirit, you know, to for safety, and as as they were praying for safety, they they were actually elevated off the ground, uh, and they continued to go up and up and up and up and up and up and ascend, uh, and they became the Pleiades constellation, what we call the Pleiades, uh, and it's said in the, in the Lakota stories that the reason why you've got the the stripes, the markings, you know, down the side of of this of the rock face, is that's where the bear was clawing. Uh, trying to get up to reach the girls. Uh, now, with, now here's here's an interesting um, thought about this Lakota story. So we've got uh, we've got a, a ancient uh, monolithic site uh, that you know with that flat surface at the top. Uh, you've got the story of the Lakota girls seeking safety, uh, and in their seeking safety, they're they're teleported, uh, brought up, caught up, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in, the, in the Lakota story, it says that they ascended up uh, into the sky realm. Uh, now, what's what's interesting to me about it is they're being chased by a bear. Well, in the native constellations, uh, the bear constellation is also this also the same as the serpent, the Draco constellation. Uh, so, is there a correlation there? Uh, I don't know, but I think it's kind of interesting uh, just through the through the worldview of the Lakota people. Uh, who call the Draco constellation the Bear constellation, uh, and yet we and here we see the story of of uh, is it a stargate? Is it a a portal? Is it a gateway? Uh, is it a place where the people would go and get you know whisked up, beamed up uh, into the heavenlies? Uh, it sounds like it, uh, you know, just from conjecture and just from hearing these stories. Uh, do we know for sure? No, no, we don't. Uh, but that's one uh, another example of. Uh, the Pleiades constellations being tied in with the oral native tradition. Interesting, uh, because uh, I don't know if you've heard David Carico's teaching he did on the Pleiades, binding the Pleiades, because the Bible talks about binding the Pleiades. And um, this, these, this is a real important one to Freemasonry as well. When you see uh, the Freemason drawings that have the arches, and then they have inside that arches they have these stars that's uh that consider the pleiades uh inside there they have those seven stars and um it, this is this is really like a huge in the occult and in every uh, major civilization the pleiades and, and the bible even speaks of binding the pleiades it's interesting these celestial beings mm -hmm. they call wow, them. that's really interesting yeah he did a whole he whole thing on it. it's really like really amazing the way he put I'll it. Have to check it out. That sounds good. Yeah, it is really good. Um, so, anyways, let me find this other question here. We got several more here trying to get through. Let's see. Um, 
Okay. Um, Jay Cassius asks, and he's over on YouTube. He says, uh, can you ask them what their thoughts are about Nephilim descendants being alive to this day? Can they be saved or are they bond to bound to turn into demons? Thanks. Hmm. I think that, I think that Nephilim DNA is irredeemable. Um, but you know what? Creator can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants. I, I can speculate all day long on some genetics uh, that, that are still popping up uh, with people. I'm not the righteous judge, so it's not it doesn't really matter what I think or say when it comes to, you know, somebody has Nephilim DNA and they try to turn to the Lord. Um, I, I just don't feel qualified enough to try to answer that question. Uh, lest I be taking the, the seat of the righteous judge and no way, man, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're in a chicken, tricking the judge in somebody's DNA, but we don't, you know, we don't, none of us know our DNA really anyway. And what, what is the marker for Nephilim DNA? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people want to tie it to an RH negative and all these different things, but we really just don't know. And I believe that if he calls you unto them, unto himself, if you have that spirit that wants to actually repent, um, you know, that's, that's, I wouldn't worry about it. If you feel like you, you feel the need to repent, you feel the need to come to the father, you feel the need to live a holy life. I, I, I would have a hard time believing that you're a Nephilim in any way, shape or form. Right. Um, anyways, um, so I keep losing track of where we're at here. So we just went with Jay Cassius, uh, and then Valerie asks, um, has chief River one ever heard of the Mima mounds in Washington state? No, I've never been there. Although we will be in Washington State soon uh, for a conference, but uh, next year. But I, I'm not familiar with those mountains. No. All right. Uh, Swindle part asks. Um, I don't I guess it's not a really a question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it in the form of a question. Uh, is the legend of the thirteen crystal skulls uh, that? that each of it has a spirit of ancient chief who can be summoned or what tell us a little bit more about the 13 crystal skulls. And a lot of people remember that from Indiana Jones. He went on a crusade to basically find these things. And what people don't realize is a lot of the things in Indiana Jones, the movie come from real, uh, real things. Oh, yeah. You know, it's amazing when you really actually study the history behind some of the stuff that you see in these movies. But uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? Um, well, the, the, the crystal skulls, they were used by, by the Mayans and the Incans. Um, I think the Aztecs for, for, uh, for a period also have some stories about them. Uh, but their purpose was, uh, it was like concentrating uh, energies, concentrating um, psychic abilities, concentrating powers. Uh, you know, like, like some in the New Age believe that you can take a quartz crystal uh, and amplify your prayers or, or, or increase the resonance of, of what you're chanting or the mantra or the chakra or whatever. Uh, in this case, uh, the skulls themselves, uh, I, I haven't heard about the summoning of the chiefs uh, of each one of the skulls. Um, the, from what I've known or from what I've heard, uh, the skulls to be used for uh, by Mayans uh, is that they were used for scrying. Uh, they were used for remote viewing. Uh, they were used for traveling. Uh, um, uh, what was what's that word? Um, uh, astral projection. Uh, astral projection. Uh, so basically, it was used as a tool uh, for for these different types of things. Uh, now, it was also uh, considered that it was a tool also for communicating with the gods. Uh, now, when we say communicating with the gods, which gods? Well, if you look at the Mayan Incan pa uh, pantheon of gods, uh, and you look at the stories of like Tenochtitlan and Teotihuacan, uh, and all these different uh, pyramids structures that were built in Mexico and Central America, uh, all of the stories of the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Incans, all of the oral traditions are very precise because of their writings uh, as to even the names of the giants that built these mounds. They were overseers, or I'm sorry, mounds of uh, temple structures. Uh, that were the ones who were the star people uh, that were the originators of, of these architectural pieces. Uh, and these crystal skulls were used to be able to channel and communicate with those uh, star people. And so that, that's, uh, that's what, it, what it was used for uh, from what I've, what I've been told, uh, what's been passed down to me. Uh, and, you know, it, 
it, it is kind of kind of unnerving to think of 13 of these things. I, I doubt that there are 13 originals because uh, the, the originals uh, of these skulls, uh, although they do exist, most of them, uh, I, I believe, are being held by secret societies somewhere, uh, Illuminati, who knows, New World Order type of people, um, you know, cult, because uh, there are some crystal skulls that are the original pre-Columbian, you know, we're talking 3,000 to 4,000-year-old uh, carvings that we cannot duplicate today. Uh, so even though uh, they had this gathering at Serpent Mound with the 13 crystal skulls, um, whether they're the original ones or not, uh, the energy, the spirit world, uh, what they're conjuring and what they're invoking is very ancient. Uh, and, and regardless of whether it's an old crystal or a new, cri new crystal, those gates are being opened uh, into the spiritual realm that don't need to be opened. So I, I hope that answers that question. I think so. And there, there's a lot of in the new age, they have the crystals is, is a big, big deal in the new age. Um, mm -hmm. they, you know, they use it for the same kind of purposes and just without a skull, it's just like crystals that they set up for, um, all kinds of weird, different and weird things. I mean, I've heard of like in, in Kabbalah, I, I don't know if it's Kabbalah. I can't remember the practice where they have these things you set up as crystals and they're supposed to chase UFOs away and weird stuff like that. So anyways, I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, so, um, where are we at? Kot ask, um, it's not about Serpent Mount, but is Dolce located on a ley line? I'm not familiar with that mound. Uh, I, I haven't been to that one, so I, I, I wouldn't know. There's so many thousands of mounds in the United States. It's yeah. <laughs> um, I was just looking at that the other day and thinking, like, I, I cannot believe how many. And there's, like, there's so many really amazing things. I think it's in Tennessee. There are these, there's thousands of these little, what they call fairy graves all over the place. And I'm like, what is this? I have to go check this stuff out. So, uh, anyways, um, the next question is from Alec. Uh, does the Serpent Mount have any relations with the Mayan god Quetzalcoatl? And if so, what about Thunderbird? So, um, so yes, uh, the the that the Serpent Mount itself in Ohio. If you read some of the earlier, or like like accounts of descriptions of it from the 1800s, uh, we'll read there anymore uh I, I i went when we were there i, I went looking for uh, these uh, the the remains of what's left of this but originally you had the serpent's head you had the serpent's head and also two smaller mounds coming out from the side um now some people speculated that it was two more heads uh but if you look at the typical uh central american um uh, iconography of quetzalcoatl uh, the feathered serpent, you find the same thing where you've got the head and you've got the, the feathers coming off of the sides. Uh, so uh, I, I think that this is, uh, it does have some influence uh, with that Mayan Incan iconography. Uh, and I believe that the Mayans and the Incans got that iconography and those beliefs from the, from the star people. I mean, it's in their writings. Their writings have survived, uh, literally it carved in stone. Uh, so we were able to read the history according to their own uh, tradition and according to their own writings. Uh, so in the Thunderbirds, in the oral tradition, it was the Thunderbirds that were the only beings that could destroy this Lord of Darkness, this uh, Meshubishu, uh, which as, as serpent, as it's called in that region, in the language of, the, of that region. Uh, and these Thunder beings were great spiritual beings. Uh, the Thunder beings, Thunderbirds. Uh, which there, there, there is a difference sometimes based on the tribe, because uh, in the Southwest, the what the tribes called the Thunderbirds, very much sounds like the description of a pterodactyl, uh, and what the, what they what the native people on the East Coast and the Northeastern tribes called the Thunderbirds or Thunder Beings, uh, were these great uh, spiritual beings, you know, with large wings, uh, that were the only ones that could subdue uh, this this feathered serpent. Or Lord of the Dark, or Lord of the Underworld. All right. The next question uh, is from Alec. What is Chief Riverwind's thoughts on the Devil's Tower in Wyoming? Would it be connected with the portal in the constellation of Pleiades? Oh, well, I, I, we just talked about that. Um, did, so. I, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just, I just talked about the story of the Lakota girls escaping from the bear. And and they got to the top of they got to the top of the monolith, yeah. And they they went up into the Pleiades, became the Pleiades, 
uh, and, and that whole connection between the bear constellation uh, also being the same as the Draco constellation. So is there a connection there with this place being a portal? Uh, or it, it's very, very possible. Uh, you know, we have to think, you know, how, how people described what they saw uh, within the limits of their language back then. And then we're trying to translate that into, you know, the limits of our language today, uh, you know, for them to see or, or retell the story of, of these young girls being, uh, of ascending, uh, of being taken up uh, into the Pleiades when being chased by the bear. Uh, it sounds like a, like a portal or some sort of gate to me, uh, which surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly enough, Spielberg does a movie about close encounters of the third kind you know right there so right. yeah i mean it's it's really there's a lot of odd coincidences associated with that that's for sure if they, if you want to call them coincidences uh but um so the next question is uh the coyote of song and the a story of the trickster uh, if you're asking if coyote is is trickster uh in a lot of the tribes yes uh the stories uh, you know, there's there's different types of stories. There's oral tradition; it's the history. Uh, and then there's stories where animals are used uh, to teach you know the children what not to do uh, and what to do, how to act. You know, life lessons. And trickster in a lot of the stories is the one who does everything contrary to what is good, contrary to what is right, contrary to what is honorable. Um, and so, in a lot of the stories about coyote, or I'm sorry, a lot of the stories about trickster depending on the tribe, will depend on the animal depiction. For example, trickster uh, can be a spider. In some native cultures, trickster can be the rabbit. Uh, like in the Muscogee Creek uh, traditions and Cherokee traditions, uh, trickster can show himself as a rabbit. Uh, but for the most part, in most of the native stories and songs, coyote is was depicted as the trickster. Always hungry, always causing problems, always destroying uh, marriages, relationships, um, sacred things. Uh, so to me, that, that's who, that's who coyote is, uh, is that embodiment of the trickster. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see here. Leon asked, um, do you consider, do tribes consider the Thunderbird to be a mystical creature or an, or alive or both? I think you kind of answered that, but yeah, I, I think it's both. Uh, like I said before, in, in a lot of the Southwestern tribes, uh, they, their stories of the Thunderbirds are actual birds, um, uh, or 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 in some cases, I, I saw an old picture uh, of some guys who were hunting in the Southwest, and and you take the picture and you compare it to the native stories the Southwestern native stories of the Thunderbird. Uh, and it very much sounds like an identical description of a pterodactyl. Um, so you've got a pterodactyl, which, which I believe is what the remnant uh, or, or, or what the people called uh, the Thunderbird. Uh, and in, in other tribes, the Thunderbird uh, was also called the Thunder Beans. Uh, and these were a more spiritual being, uh, like, a, like a large angelic being um, that was a protector of the people, uh, that was one that would fight the Uktina or the or the um, uh, maybe Shu, uh, the the horned serpent. Uh, so there's a spiritual thunderbird, thunder being, and a physical one. I, I hope that answered the question. All right, uh, Christian asked, uh, was there spiritual significance to scalping people, and what is scalping about? Uh, scalping is not a tradition that was started by native people. Uh, back during the French and Indian Wars, uh, the the government actually placed a bounty on Native people's heads, and uh, it was started by French mercenaries. Uh, and the bounty was, if I remember right, uh, if you if you took a man's scalp, it was three dollars. If you took a woman's scalp, it was two, and if you took a child's scalp, it was one. Uh, so French mercenaries were the ones who started scalping, and in in the traditional Native ways. Uh, it was there were the concept of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth uh, was a core of native of first nation civilization uh, as, as a law uh, as an instruction so for example if if you know our families got into a fight and you killed my brother 
then I had every right to come and kill your brother. But in the native way, that ended the dispute. Everything was done. Weapons were put. It's finished. It was an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Well, what ended up happening was as the government uh, put the bounty on the scalps of native people, including children, the French mercenaries took the government up on that offer. And so when, you know, a mother or a daughter or a grandson was scalped, well, in turn, the native people would retaliate with that same method that was used against them. Uh, of course, in the native way, okay, we finished it, it's done, the count has been balanced, we'll, we, we'll go back to what we were doing, and we'll mourn the loss of so-and-so and such and such. Uh, but of course, the Europeans saw it as just, oh, well, they attack, now we're going to attack back. And instead, it would just escalate and escalate and escalate uh, into battles and massacres. Of course, if the U.S. government won, it was called a battle. If the native ones, it was called a massacre. Uh, so scalping was very new to native people. It's not really a tradition that that was always among the tribes. All right. Um, the next question is from Moonpai. Uh, can you give the Indian names for the people of the tassels and the people of the scrolls? And I think you're going to like this name because it re sounds really similar to a name you're probably familiar with. So, so we are we're all preparing to go to the land of the Northern Cheyenne. Uh, uh, John, you're going to be there, and Jake and uh, Doctor Pigeon, uh, I believe, is, is also going to be coming up there, as well as some of our team. So the the Cheyenne tribe their name for themselves, their traditional name, because Cheyenne is a very modern construct of their name. Uh, but this this was told to me by a former arrow priest of the Cheyenne Nation. That's the, the holy men of, of the tribe uh, that I met when I was in the military, and he's, he's passed now. Um, but he told me that the original name of the Cheyenne was Zitzitza, uh, which means the people of the fringes. And it sounds just like Zitzi. Uh, in numbers. So Zitzitza is how they pronounce it. Um, if I've got a picture of, of the sign that says, welcome to the home of the Northern Cheyenne Nation. As a matter of fact, I posted it on the NIUC TV Fellowship Group uh, so you can see it on there where it's even spelled out, almost identical to Zitzi. And the people of the scroll, uh, that was that was in Cherokee, and I can't remember how it was that it's pronounced in Cherokee. Um, but I've, I've got that in my book. Uh, not the name, not the translation in Cherokee, though. Uh, I actually found that looking at a U.S. geological survey, and in the survey, uh, these surveyors back in the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, wrote in their report how they were finding different mines, and in these different mines, they were finding different types of tools. And when they saw uh, three Cherokee warriors coming through the woods uh, down one of the trails, they stopped them, the surveyors did, and you know, had, uh, did some trading and asked the Cherokee men uh, about these other mines. And the Cherokee men told him that, you know, there was one set of mines that, yes, belonged to them. Uh, this is in the North Georgia region. But the other mines uh, belonged to the people of the scroll, uh, who were a dark-skinned, bearded people. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, of all the places to find recollection of, of these men, on uh, this journey, a U.S. geological survey. So I've got that in my book. That's what the old ones say. Uh, it, it's one of my sources there, and, and you can look it up and uh, and find it. But it, unfortunately, it didn't say the name in Cherokee uh, of how to say people of the scrolls. Interesting. And so uh, we got just, a, let's see, four more questions here. So we can probably think some of them are, you know, are pretty quick questions here. Uh, Lag asks, um, is there anything about the giants returning in the native lore uh you know that that i can think of uh no uh, not not that i could think of off the top of my head uh there's a lot of end time prophecies uh that that concern the animals and the land and uh constellations and different things like that but in none of the stories that that i could think of do we have anything about uh, the giants returning that's a good question, though. Yeah, I never yeah. thought of that. I guess unless you want to think of the uh, white Sasquatch as one of the giants returning, that's a right, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's that's interesting. That is a good question. Um, and so the next question is from Gina, and she says, um, "Are there any stories having to do with O negative blood?" Uh, well, considering that native people didn't really know what O negative meant. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, that's, that's not a very new or that's not a very old discovery, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really wouldn't know how to answer that question. Um, that's just not something that we would know. We wouldn't have known blood types. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. Um, Cot asks, how does one acquire a map of actual ley lines? Uh, I'm not the expert in that. Uh, I do have a friend who that's what he's been doing for about 40 years, uh, is mapping out ley lines all across the world, and he travels. Um, and uh, that, I'm just not an expert on in that field. I, I'm sure you could probably ask Rabbi Google, you know, yeah. ley line maps and, and yeah. find some researchers that are experts in that. Yeah, there's definitely someone there. And like I mentioned before, uh, Graham Hancock wrote a book and gives a map, an, an older map that has ley lines and stuff like that on it, too. It's a good book. If you ever get a chance to get it, I mean, this guy was brilliant. Um, and obviously, I'm not in one accord with everything he talks about. But as far as historical purpose and mapping and, and doing all that, this guy, man, I mean, I've never seen a better scholar on this subject. This book's this thick, but he's got every um, serpent culture serpent um in the world documented to the t in this book it's a big book uh not an easy read but if you want to know some stuff you'll you get that book graham hancock uh fingerprints of the gods so um sounds good yeah definitely man I, I i can't say enough uh i can't get enough high marks to the book even though it's very it's not a, it's not something you're going to whisk through in a in a couple hours or in a couple of weeks even so uh, but Femi asks, uh, this is the last question, and she says, um, this hasn't, she says, forgive me if it's been asked, but it has not been asked yet, and it's a it's a pretty good question. Um, I'm trying to get my headphones to work here. Okay, so um, she said, I'm not familiar with the customs of Native American tribes, but what do you think about the practice of looking for, meditating for, doing a ritual for, a purpose of finding a spirit animal? I personally would stick to the word of Yah versus the tradition, but as I said, I know very little about this matter. Please and thank you. That's a good, really, that's a really good question. Uh, unfortunately, New Age has really hijacked uh, and twisted a lot of ancient Native traditions and customs uh, for for just for the sake of making a buck, uh, making some money. And one of one of those is the misconception of uh, Native people doing ceremonies to find a spirit animal. Uh, or, 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 you know, anything to that effect. Um, Native people as a whole, now I'm not speaking for all tribes, but most tribes, um, you know, their original instructions uh, had to do with taking care of the earth and taking care of the four-legged and the winged and all those things that Creator made. Um, now, that's very different than worshiping what Creator made. It was being caretakers of what Creator made. Who are we to destroy what Creator is, has made? You know, Romans 1.20 says, I've shown myself to every nation of the earth and things seen and unseen. Therefore, man is without excuse. So even in the things that we saw and what creator made and even the things that we couldn't see, the spiritual realm, the wind, you know, that, that we can't see, but we can see the effect of, um, we respected that. Now, in New Age circles, this thing has popped up, you know, shamanism, uh, which, which in many tribes, uh, any type of witchcraft was dealt with very severely. Like the Cherokee, the Cherokee punishment, in the Cherokee Nation and the tribes, if you got caught doing witchcraft, you were executed publicly. Uh, it was something that was illegal. Uh, it was an instant punishment of death if you were caught summoning spirits or or doing any type of witchcraft. Now, when it comes to animal spirits or animal beings, uh, what our what our ancestors teach us is that we have things that we can learn from the animals, uh, and even in the Book of Job, you know, it, it says uh, for us to learn from the animals. Uh, several times, I think it's in Job seven and Job eight. Uh, you know, it, it tells us to to learn from what Creator has made, learn from the animals, uh, but we don't worship them. Now, the idea of a spirit guide—that's uh, where some of the New Age twisting comes in. You know, the only only spirit guide I need is the Holy Spirit. You know, that's the only spirit guide any of us needs. Uh, now, if you know, say I'm praying for something and 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 Creator happens to you know send an eagle to to fly by as I'm doing a specific prayer, as a confirmation that's different, that's not a spirit animal. Um, the the concept of spirit animals and fasting and ceremonies for that, uh, a lot of it is not rooted in native tradition. Uh, while, while the concept of learning from those animals, like say for example, you went through manhood ceremony, or you went through womanhood ceremony, 
Uh, and then there's a certain animal uh, that shows up while you're fasting. You know, you're fasting for four days, no food and no water. And you go through a cleansing ceremony before you go to lodge. And then you go, you know, you're fasting four days, no water, no food. You're praying and certain animals show up. Or you would make note of those animals uh, and not to pray for them. They're not your spirit animal, you know, but creator sent you those animals to teach you something. And so then you would take those animals, whether it's a wolf or a hummingbird or, you know, whatever animal it is that appeared during that fast, during that ceremony. And then you would pray to creator and ask, what are you trying to teach me from the attributes of this animal? You know, like a wolf teaches us about pack, teaches us about our family, teaches us about being protective over our cubs, uh, uh, being protective over our territory, taking care of our elders. You know, there's so much that a wolf can teach us, but it doesn't make it our guide. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we have to really be able to sift through the new age junk. Uh, and a lot of a lot of the new age stuff or stuff that says that is, you know, writing about native spirituality or religion is, is new age made up junk. I mean, it literally is. So even we're traditionalists, uh, you know, not even, you know, Christian believers uh, or, or, or messianic or any type of believers, but even the traditionalists, you know, are speaking out against the new age exploitation of a lot of these ways uh, for making money. Yeah. I mean, like you said, and my headphones are acting up here, but like you said, that that stands for any religion. I mean, the church is full of new age practices and they've adapted mm -hmm. into their um, pagan ways. So, you know, you have that and no matter what you're going to do, there's always going to be that infiltration. But anyways, that is the last question. Well, we've went over uh, 15 minutes over tonight, but it was a really, really good show. We're thankful to even just to be able to have you on, man. It's always a pleasure talking to you and I'm really excited to meet you face to face. And, um, I know Jake is as well. He's over there sitting. It looks like you're laying down, Jake, the way you, way you got, <laughs> you know, like you're, like you're barely there so but uh, uh, we'll, <laughs> we're losing them we're losing them into my seat over here <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's uh, uh we'll give him a little slack he's been throwing up for the past yeah 24 hours we'll cut him a cut him a little bit of slack on it but uh I still gotta make fun of him for laying down looks like he's like a little kid sitting up and trying to <laughs> trying trying to peek well, over the the desk there so <laughs> well i do have uh, uh laurelin came up and and, and she said uh, she gave me the better numbers and statistics uh, when I was talking about the paranormal conference that came. Uh, and I think, let me see, it says um, 10 attempted suicides uh, uh, and nine overdoses. One was fatal. Uh, it, so I just wanted to make sure I get the correct numbers out there. Uh, but, but folks, if, if there's anything, be prayed up during, during this, uh, during, you know, we're coming up to Hasatan, the deceiver's highest unholy day. Uh, of the year, you know, jokingly people would talk about, you know, oh, well, Native Americans are pagan and this and that. And I would jokingly say back, okay, well, you, you tell me that while you're celebrating Christmas and Easter, which are rooted in occult paganism. <clears throat> but um, all, all that to say, you know, we have to be armored up. We have to be ready. Uh, the spiritual attacks on believers is more concerted. The efforts are more in your face. I mean, when you have covens calling for, uh, ceremonies to cast spells and curses against the president of the United States. And they're doing it publicly, you know, and, and charisma magazine puts out a, a survey saying that 65, approximately 65% of Christians in the church don't even believe demons exist. You know, there is a problem. And we wonder why people aren't going to the church. We wonder why people want nothing to do with established, you know, religious assemblies when there's no power there, when spiritual warfare isn't being taught, when these topics that you guys bring up and these topics of the occult, the Illuminati, you know, th these things aren't all conspiracies. You know, it's a conspiracy if it's not true, but there's truth behind all of this. And, and we have to be ready more than ever. You know, we've got intercessors that are going to be praying just for you guys because you're coming to this reservation and the reservation, it, the spirit world is wide open, uh, especially uh, where we're going. Uh, I sent Jake a message too, and, and uh, I sent you a message about this. Uh, where we're going is a hot spot for UFO activity. Um, so, you know, are we going to see something while we're out there? I don't know. Uh, you know, but we're definitely going to be prayed up. We're going to be interceding. Um, if any of, if any of you, anyone who's listening uh, would like to sponsor someone to go on this trip, 
Uh, it's $150. And that, that covers 16 meals. It covers their insurance. And we're looking for sponsors for the Anishinaabe, uh, White Earth, uh, people who are wanting to go on this mission trip, some of who's never left the reservation and gone to another reservation to see how other tribes live. And um, it'll be their first time going out, which is awesome. You know, after ministering here and seeing Native leaders starting to, to pick up that mantle. Uh, so, you know, be in prayer about sponsoring, uh, uh, you know, people to go on this trip. Uh, but more so, more importantly, be armored up. You know, ask the Ruach HaKodesh, ask the Holy Spirit to, you know, show you things in your home that are possible gateways, movies, books, uh, even, you know, sometimes th something that grandma gave you might be something you have to pass through the fire uh, and get rid of. But, Folks, you you are in a war the moment you came to the Messiah, the moment that you that you accepted Yeshua as your Lord and Savior. You are in the middle of a war. There's a big target that's put on your back, and you have to learn how to war in the spirit against these things. It's a very, very real war. Hey Amen, and thank you so much, uh, Chief River Wind. Thanks, we, we appreciate you, and we will uh, – see you soon and thank you for all of our listeners you guys have been great a lot of really really good questions and uh we're excited to have family like you guys people like you guys that have just um broken the barriers of society basically you've you've looked past the, the you've looked past the things that the world's trying to trick you with you've looked past that and it's really neat to have you guys uh, I call you, you know, call you friends, family, whatever you want to call it. You to have you guys around to be able to uh, just speak with, and and I know uh, Joseph and Jake feel the same same way, and um, you know, I, I I couldn't ask for more. And so I don't know. I think we have a show scheduled tomorrow night. Um, we will be doing it from Denver. Um, we sh we I tried to make sure we found a place that has Wi-Fi so we can continue doing the shows. We're going to try to do virtual house. We're meeting with a couple. Uh, fellowships while we're while we're in in um, in Denver area, we're going to be meeting with a couple of different fellowships on I think Friday and Saturday. So we'll be speaking there and talking with them, and then we'll be shooting. So we'll be busy the whole time, but we're still going to do the midnight ride. We're still going to do virtual house church, y'all willing, obviously, and hopefully still do a show tomorrow night. So like like um, like Chief Joseph said, keep us on your prayers. Uh, we will be praying for you as well. This is a major satanic holiday coming up where people are sacrificed, animals are sacrificed, humans, children are being being abducted like crazy for these rituals. And um, this is a major day. And it's not just a major day for the low lives of society. It's a major day for a lot of the people that are actually considered the leaders. Um, I would say the bleeders of this country. And they practice these days and they have very high access to these people, these children, to whatever. And so just be in prayer. The enemy is going to be, and his servants are going to be working double overtime. Let's work double overtime too and be in prayer against these things. And uh, so anyways, good night, guys. High five. Jake, you're going to wake up over there and give us high five, man. <laughs> <laughs> he's forcing that. I can tell he's hurting right now. But anyways, thank you. Thank night. you, guys. Good night, guys. Good night.